The Prime Minister's testimony wraps up this portion of the Rouleau inquiry. And to discuss what was shared, we are joined once again by our journalist panel. Joanna Smith is the Ottawa Bureau Chief for the Canadian Press. Chris Nardi is parliamentary reporter for the National Post. Good to see both of you. You too, Michael. Hi, Michael. Good to see you. And you. Uh, listen, before we get into the details of today, I, I actually want to begin here with your impressions. Because as I said, it's not often that we see a sitting Prime Minister testify before an inquiry. Uh, but Justin Trudeau said he wants Canadians to know, the, uh, quote, the inputs the government had in making this de uh, decision. Joanna, what do you make of the Prime Minister's testimony? Was he open enough? So it's interesting because I think yesterday I said I would be interested to see if he was introspective at all, as he sometimes is. And and he was in a way, not in a reflective, self-critical way, but he sort of in his you know really key part of his testimony let us in a little bit into what he was thinking um, exactly in the moment. It was 3.41 p.m. on February 14th when he received what he called the decision note from the clerk of the Privy Council that had, you know, top civil servant in Canada recommending the Emergencies Act be invoked. And he said he thought to himself, okay, what if I don't sign it? What if I wait a few days? And he sort of walked us through an imaginary scenario in which he waits a few days or doesn't do it. And maybe a police officer ends up in hospital. Maybe things get so much worse. Um, so I, I think he, you know, and then he said that he could potentially have been ended up testifying uh, before a public inquiry for very different reasons. Um, so I think he he did answer that question directly in the sense that if he, as Prime Minister, ultimately bears responsibility for this decision, um, then he confirmed that it, it was in fact his decision. But at the same time, he made it clear that he was getting all these inputs, that word we keep hearing over and over again. Um, that he was he was comfortable. He was in fact absolutely serene in making the decision because of those inputs. In particular, the sign off from the head of Canada's public service. Um, mm -hmm. And and so yes, it was his decision. But he talked very much about being a consensus around the table. Yeah, consensus around the t the table. But again, here he is answering these questions, and as you say, being reflective at times. Chris, what did you make of uh, the Prime Minister's testimony? A again, a rare event in this country. Was he open enough? Did Trudeau answer the questions directly? Directly enough. Well, he answered the questions, but ultimately, uh, Michael, the issue is is that we still have that kind of key missing piece of information that we've talked about all week, and it is the legal advice that was, he said, given verbally by David Lametti, the Justice Minister, to Cabinet on the day before the Emergencies Act was invoked, and that basically explains their definition of the Emergencies Act and how, or the threshold basically required to invoke it. He did, though, dive a little bit more into the legal argument than I think any previous uh, witness has this week. He basically explained that the part of the CSIS Act definition of a threat to national security that they were really intently focused on was the one that had to do with ideological or political, politically motivated violence. And that was the ma main core of the assessment that they were looking at and trying to determine if the Freedom Convoy did in fact pose a threat to Canada, both economically, both because of violence and because of the threat of weapons. He talked about, you know, children being used as barriers at protests. He talked about a car that was run into a police car and into the, 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 the police, generally speaking, in Coots, Alberta. Like, that was all part of this larger, broader definition of a threat to national security that Cabinet considered. Um, so it's a little bit of insight, but obviously he didn't waive that solicitor-client privilege that we've been hearing about all week. Um, so I think that the Commission will still be hitting their head uh, against the wall for that. Um, but ultimately, yeah, I think Joanna made a good point. You know, and I, I too was wondering after she mentioned the, the introspectiveness that he can have sometimes, uh, if that would appear today. And to certain uh, you know degrees, it does. He did say that he looked at the piece of paper uh, that would invoke the EA and basically wondered, what happens if I don't do this? But, you know, as Joanna mentioned, he's completely serene with that decision, obviously has no regrets. And we'll see if the commissioner, you know, eventually determines that he should. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, to, to, to your point, something that's been raised ever since David Lametti made his appearance at the Commission, the exact legal advice given by the Department of Justice has not yet been shared. Although I do want to play uh, that portion of the testimony that you were talking about, Chris, that portion where essentially the Prime Minister points to the CSIS definition for a national emergency. Let's take a listen to his testimony. 
that was what we were looking at. Is that threshold met? Are there activities supporting the threats or acts of serious violence, a threat of serious violence for political or ideological goals? Um, if that threshold was met in our reasoned opinion, then that part of invoking a public order emergency was met. The other part of it is, does it constitute a national emergency? And there's elements on that that I won't get into unless you, you ask me about. But I was very much focused on, was this bar hit, yes or no, for the purposes of invoking uh, the Emergencies Act? Okay, Joanna, what's interesting about that is there has been, as both of you know, been a lot of discussion uh, as to whether or not the government was bound by the CSIS definition of a national threat. But here you have Justin Trudeau referencing a definition within the CSIS Act itself. So how far, Joanna, does that go in justifying the invocation? I think we're getting a little bit more insight into their thinking on this. I mean, when, when previously officials came and talked about the CSIS Act definition being too narrow, they were talking about it, like Jody Thomas, the National Security Advisor in particular, if I recall correctly, was talking about it, its need to be modernized, that it was too narrow because it was maybe out of date. And, and Trudeau frames it a little bit differently today. He talked about it being deliberately narrow and says that's because it was meant to restrain you know, to frame the activities of CSIS itself, not restrict the government, an elective government, uh, presumably, in a situation like this. And he, he says, you know, he added the government is in fact allowed to accept input from other sources uh, besides CSIS and its definition, including the RCMP, other federal departments and agencies, and that ultimately the decision rests with cabinet. But again, as Chris said, as you said, we keep coming back to that key missing bit of information, the legal analysis that the Department of Justice provided. Everything seems to flow from that. His comfort with the decision uh, that was recommended by the clerk of the Privy Council, she recommended that based also on this decision. So again, we're, we're missing that really key bit of information that allows us to see really clearly exactly what they were considering when they when they made this choice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, we started by talking about uh, Justin Trudeau's, uh, uh, I guess, performance on the stand today. But I, I want to put the whole government in this past week, their testimony into context, uh, into context rather, because the prime minister was the grand finale, if you will, the last person to testify. Uh, Overall, after weeks of testimony, if the commission is meant to determine whether the invocation was justified, how well did the government, through its ministers this whole week, present its case? Chris? Well, I think it presented a very strong political argument. I think it, pre you know, it presented a very strong emotional argument. You know, there's a lot of people, particularly Ottawa residents or people who were affected by the various blockades across the country who will, you know, relive the testimonies of the last few weeks and, and relive then the, the, you know, the events of the Freedom Convoy protests and say, yeah, yeah, absolutely, that was a situation and we needed to get rid of that regardless of what it took, right? What, who, which government acted, we don't care. Um, so I think on that respect, it's very successful. But ultimately, the Emergencies Act is a law. It requires a legal threshold to invoke it. And I'm not entirely convinced that that legal threshold will be met because, as we've you know talked about extensively this week, it, the, the government's invocation depends on a legal let's say definition that is not necessarily the one that seems written you know pen to paper in the law in the emergencies act and in the definition of the CSIS act so the commissioner I, I really do not envy Paul Rouleau but his job will be to look at this and say well does the was the government right to interpret this more broadly without actually having the advice that the government relied on to do so uh, or should we take the law as it's written word for word and say well sorry if CSIS said there was no actual threat to national security then you didn't meet it so the legal argument is the one that's really tough to make and I'm not sure that it was made yeah Joanna what do you think because here you have again the Prime Minister the Deputy Prime Minister, the Defence Minister, the Public Safety Minister, uh, the Transport Minister, all appearing before the Commission. How well did the government present its case? I think it presented its case well in the sense that I believe they all felt <laughs> they were justified in invoking the Emergencies Act, but whether they were legally justified in doing so is still under that 
black box, as one of the commission lawyers said, because of that missing legal analysis. And the other thing that comes to mind is something that's been on my mind since the beginning of inquiry, and frankly, even during the Freedom Convoy itself, even before the Emergencies Act was invoked and it was sort of the idea of it happening was it was in the air and in conversations and my reporters were all in the thick of it covering this momentous event was if the Commission ends up determining that it was justified, is it only because things were so badly mismanaged and what could have been done better to prevent things from getting so out of control that anyone even started talking about it. I think that that is what that's not the decision of of the commissioner necessarily, but his part of his mandate is not just to determine whether they were justified in triggering this legislation, but to examine the circumstances around it. And I think what we what we have learned throughout this inquiry through testimony and documents has just confirmed a thousandfold um, what we all sort of saw on the outside from the outset was that this was just so overwhelmingly uh, mismanaged and out of control to the point where maybe it ended up being justified just because up to that point people had not been doing their jobs properly. Well, we await the final report from uh, Commissioner Ruloa. Until then, Joanna, Chris, really appreciate the time once again. Thank you for this. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for having us. Have a great weekend. You too.